right, amen. I want to uh, welcome uh, those of you who are on our call live tonight. Welcome to our latest edition of Perspective Matters Online Bible Study. I'm your host, Pastor Philip Lowe, and we're continuing on in our series, Living with Purpose. Uh, we're in week number 59 of this, uh, of this series, and our topic tonight, as we plunge forward into this series, Living with Purpose, uh, not only are we dealing with living with purpose, but we're at a juncture, we've reached a juncture in our teaching where we're talking about living with purpose by turning potential into action, turning purpose, uh, turning potential into action. You know, um, one of the things that I've come to find, and if you've spent any time at all in church, um, you will see that oftentimes Bible study and, and the Word um, really takes on a theoretical type of a feel to it rather than an experiential feel to it. And what we want to do today, and, and as we continue on in this series, Living with Purpose, is to really put meat on the bones when it comes down to our faith. Uh, we don't want to just be doctrinal about doctrine, but we want to apply doctrine to our lives because the doctrine was intended for us to experience God experientially not to theorize about a God that we can't see and oftentimes don't genuinely experience. We don't relate the word, we don't relate him personally to the personal issues of our lives. We have this impersonal relationship with God as a result. And that is what typically we tend to find in the church, people in a building but who aren't in Christ Jesus. Uh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Uh, that, that, that's a word right there. People in a building but not in Christ. They share the same space, but they aren't sharing the same experience with a God they were meant to experience. Getting to know and be known by God intimately. Today's topic is freed to obey. I, I want to relate tonight your freedom to your obedience to God. What's interesting is oftentimes when we look at the concept of law, when we look at the concept of law, most of us look at law as a series of rules and regulations. We don't typically interpret law, the giving of laws, as the giving of freedom. But in fact, I want to challenge us to begin to look at law. If you look at the laws of your jurisdiction, whatever state or county or town that you live in, uh, the, 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 the state that you live in, the country that you live in, if you live in these United States, we, have, we are governed by an ever-growing series of laws. Now, most of us tend to focus in on what the law says you cannot do. You can't do this and you can't do that. You can't drive any faster than. You can't or you can make a turn on, on a red light. You can make a right turn on a red light. Every jurisdiction has different laws. Then you have the laws that govern the whole of the country. And most of us tend to look at the laws as just a series of, of rules and regulations that tell us what we cannot do. But there's an aspect to law that by the very way that it tells you what you cannot do, it's also suggesting and implying what you can do even though it's not specifically saying that you can do thus and so. By what it's telling you you cannot do, you can infer 
and you can imply what it's telling you that you can do. And guess what? When you tend to look at the law uh, as a financial kind of a guy, as a guy who came out of the uh, financial services industry uh, for so many years, um, well, the, the industry is governed by laws, particularly tax law. Tax law tells you what you cannot do. Um, deriving income and, and, and think things of that, of that sort. But what tax law tells you you can do, it doesn't actually tell you. But by virtue of what it says you cannot do, it's suggesting what you can do. And there's far more that you can do within the confines of the law than what you cannot do. I hope you, I hope you're getting this. I want you to take a fresh look at the Word of God. The Word of God is oftentimes referred to as the law of God because it, it does encompass um, commands, if you will, rules to live by. And many people tend to reject God and His Word because they're, from their perspective, they're looking at the word of God as what you cannot do in life. You can't do this. You can't do that. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not do that. Rather than focusing in on what you can do, what the law of God allows. Uh, I want to make a statement today, tonight. You have been freed to obey. You have been freed to obey. I want you to meet me in the book of Second John, all the way in the back of the Bible. This is uh, John's second letter to the church, particularly to the church at uh, Jerusalem and was scattering and growing around the then known world. John, uh, writing from, from Patmos while he was a prisoner, writing to encourage those who he formerly pastored and those who he was hoping to pastor either again or anew. He was up in age, the oldest of the surviving disciples, now apostles, um, Paul may have been, I'm sorry, uh, John may have been uh, somewhere in his 90s when he wrote this particular letter. His, this is second letter to, to the church, to the body of Christ, the body of believers. Now, I want you to meet us in, uh, meet me in second John, the first chapter. Before we go into that, let's go into prayer. Let us invite the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to govern our gathering. Amen. Father God, we come before you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We ask especially that you now at this hour settle our hearts, settle our spirits, settle our minds as we join you and one another in koinonia, in fellowship. Lord God, we ask that, that we set aside our day, whether it was full of triumphs or trials, we set it all aside and we press into the present, this high calling of God that lies before us to become your ambassadors on this earth, to govern ourselves as your disciples, as your true followers, to find ourselves in Christ, even though we're not found in the same building. Lord God, this gathering is a gathering of believers from across the country, even around the world, as those who will uh, chime in and, and watch and listen to this recording after the fact on YouTube video on demand from diverse, not only parts of this nation, but even diverse parts of this world. Lord God, we are your body, and we assemble together to hear from heaven tonight. So, Lord God, we are asking your presence and your power be experienced by us this evening. 
Holy Spirit, have your way. Say what it is you would have us to hear, and then prick our spirits and convict and convince us to do what it is that you're telling us to do without hesitancy, without procrastination, without fear. We rebuke every spirit coming out of the kingdom of darkness, the demonic realm that would seek to hinder your work being done in us, to us, and through us. Oh God, that we might be full recipients of the fullness of your gospel. Lord God, we accept you as the Christ, our Lord and our Savior, not theoretically, but experientially. Lord, let us experience you tonight in the fullness of your power. Holy Spirit, have your way. Think with my mind and speak with my mouth those truths that you would have us to not only know, not only to hear, but to do. That we might see you at work in the midst and have as a result what it is we see. These things we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen and amen. Would you join me in uh, 2 John 2? Um, so, yeah, 2 John, I'm sorry, chapter 1. I'm going to start off with in verse number 4. Our anchor verse is verse number 6. I'm going to read out of the um, ESV, as I oftentimes do. I want to read um, verses 4 through uh, 4 through 11. 4 through 11. Uh, th this passage speaks of walking in truth and love. Two things that are absolutely absent in our day, in our times. Truth and love. John um, is teaching. John, who walked with Jesus, who was a part of his earthly ministry, is teaching by way of experience, his experience with Jesus Christ, who he, he calls himself the disciple whom he loved, whom Jesus loved. He, he speaks from an intimacy with our Lord. And he speaks through the power of the Holy Spirit that same spirit that was present in Christ during his earthly ministry, being present in John's life, and John experiencing that relationship all of these years after Jesus had physically ascended into heaven. His spirit was given in his physical place, that not only could he be with one disciple, but he could be living in all disciples. This is what makes us not Christians, but makes us disciples. This is a clarion call to discipleship, not Christendom. Don't you miss this. Check this out. You'll see where I'm going. Beginning at verse 4, 2 John chapter 1, verse 4. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Let's put a period on that one. This is the command that encapsulates this, not only message, but this letter, written to a woman to then be given and disseminated throughout the church in Jerusalem. It was written specifically to a woman to give to the church. Uh, don't don't just don't just um, let this one slip past you. Don't let this slide to you. Here's a letter addressed to the church, but specifically given to a particular woman who was involved at that church, a leader in the church of Jerusalem. Ladies, be encouraged. The Lord has not left you out in any way, shape, or form. 
when it comes down to ministering or ministry. Don't you take a back seat. Don't don't uh, sit down when the Lord has told you to stand up and has given you a word. Just as this word was to be given to the church through this particular woman. And the word is... Not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is an old word given new life to be disseminated to the church through a woman. Listen, verse number 6. And this is love. I, I, I love it. I love it. The Holy Spirit speaking through John and th through John's pen not only said that the commandment is that you love one another, but it goes so far, he goes so far as to describe what love is from God's perspective. This is love. And this is love. Listen, that we walk according to the commandments. God is leaving us no doubt what his perspective of love is. Love isn't just about affection. It's not about palpitating hearts. It's not about the ground moving under your feet. It's not about um, uh, having a weak stomach when that certain somebody shows up on the scene. From God's perspective, this is love. That we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment. Just as you have heard from the beginning. So that you should walk in it. Verse 7. Here it is. This speaks to us in our generation. In our now. Verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Wow. Wow. Who is deceiving? Who's out in the world deceiving? Those who are looking past, not preparing for the physical coming of Jesus Christ. Those who are not taking a, a, a view of the word and of the gospel as a means of preparing themselves or others for the coming of Christ and his kingdom in the flesh, in the physical realm. In other words, this is not a theoretical exercise, but this is as real as you can get. It's as real as the chair that you're sitting on or the bed that you're laying upon right now as you're listening to this. I'm talking about where the rubber meets the road. This is not to be a theoretical religious undertaking or exercise, studying the word of God, learning doctrine. We, we, we've, we've come to call it, even in seminary, Christian doctrine. Uh, 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 that, that, that's a misappropriation of the truth. This is disciple. Doctrine. This is Jesus' doctrine. It doesn't belong to a religion. It belongs to those who want to be in relationship with Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And he calls you his disciples. Don't let anybody deceive you by virtue of uh, trying to summon your affections into a religion, rather into a relationship with the one who saved you. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Is the deceiver and the anti? Wow, John did not mince words. The deceiver and the antichrist. Hmm. Verse number eight, watch yourselves. Oh, I love it. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may with but but may win 
a full reward. John is saying, I don't want you to be shortchanged, so be careful. Watch yourselves. When you hear teaching and preaching, you be careful. You be careful of who you open your spirit up to. You be careful of whose word and whose gospel you're receiving. Because if it does not entail the preparation of a coming Jesus Christ and his kingdom in the flesh, then that person is deceiving you and is after the spirit of the Antichrist. John is making us watchful and paying acute attention to what we hear and who we're hearing from. Verse number 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoa, stop the presses. Hold on. Let's read this one one more time. Everyone who goes on ahead. What does that mean? Go on ahead. In other words, whoever goes on ahead of what is written as the gospel. Whoever is adding stuff to what has already been written, whoever isn't adding, who isn't including all of the gospel, not just a verse or two, not uh, taking things out of context, but looking at the fullness and the wholeness of the truth, the word of truth, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. That is a summary statement right there. This is an indictment of Christians and Christianity today. Because <laughs> how many people are assembling, be it on Sundays or whatever day of the week they tend to gather? And they aren't abiding in the teaching of Christ. They may be abiding in quote-unquote Christian doctrine. They may be abiding according to the rules and regulations that pour out of a religious denomination. But if they're not abiding in the teaching of Christ himself, if their politics don't look like the politics of Christ, if they're, they're not loving and abiding in the love of Christ, if they're not governing themselves after the teachings of Jesus that come out of the scripture, John is saying, don't you have any part in them? Come up out of them. Listen. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Wow. <laughs> if you want to be in Christ, you've got to abide in his teaching. Abiding in his teaching, obeying his, his word, obeying his commandments, obeying the laws that came from the lips of Christ. And the pen of the disciples and the apostles who followed him. Those are the ones who have both the Father and the Son. They've been reconciled by one to the other. They've been reconciled back to God the Father by the Son because they, not, they believe in the Son experientially. They're experiencing his word because they're doing it. Whoa. Verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... Yeah. What teaching? This teaching. Do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. John is writing and saying, I don't care what word they're bringing you. If they're not bringing you the pure and unadulterated teachings of Jesus, have nothing to do with such a person. Don't even greet them, much less welcome them into your midst or go into theirs. Our churches today are teaching an awful lot of stuff. We find the evangelical Christian world besieged by politics and politicking, 
seeking power and even wealth of this world rather than the power and the wealth of the kingdom of God available to us through Jesus Christ by abiding in Jesus Christ and his word. Yes, you've been freed for something, all right? Jesus went to the cross to redeem you, to free you, to obey. Second John, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, out of the NIV. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Freed to obey. Freed to obey. Ah. One more time. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands, as you have heard from the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. Second John 1, 6. Listen, when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he said, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. Wow. Wow. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. I'm coming out of Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, if you want to follow along. If you're watching live, uh, I've got it right up here on the PowerPoint. You are free, listen, this is God's word, to Adam and Eve, his first man and woman, in the Garden of Eden. You are free. Uh, love it. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. That's a whole lot of freedom. <laughs> That's a whole lot of freedom. Think of all of the vegetation that was available to them in the Garden of Eden. But in the freedom that God gave Adam and Eve, he put the brakes on that freedom. There was a limitation placed upon them. He says, he continues on and says, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Love the way that this uh, word is structured. You, you can derive an awful lot from Scripture by not only the words that's used, etymology, but also by grammar. It says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, semicolon. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, comma. The Lord gives a command. He gives a limitation to the freedom that he gives. There's a whole lot more freedom than there is in limitation. Out of all of the trees, you mean I, can, I can't eat from one? That's what God is saying. Yep, just one. All the rest is yours. Have at it. Have yourselves a good time. Knock yourselves out. Just this one tree. Just stay away from that one. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. That last statement. People ask oftentimes, uh, <laughs> as they, they consider God, as to whether or not he is real and whether or not his word is merely theoretical. They, they ask, well, certainly God knew when he made man. That man was going to fall. That man was not going to obey his word. Yeah. Notice how this sentence, this, this particular uh, scripture comes to an end. For when you eat of it, God wrote, <laughs> for when you eat of it. In other words, <laughs> I already know that you are. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And that's exactly what happened. God knows the end of a thing before the beginning. So even before the beginning began, God had an answer for the failure of man to obey his word. Because God blessed us with the blessed gift of free will. He gave us freedom built into us even when it came down to obeying him. God says, I'm not going to make you do anything. I didn't create you to be a robot. But your love for me will govern your behavior. 
Your love for me will govern whether or not you do what I say. And I've already provided an answer when you blow it. When you blow it, I'll make it all right so that you can come back and not blow it again. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And that's precisely what happened to man. Did Adam and Eve die right away? Physically, no, but spiritually they did. They were immediately separated from God and separated from his provision. They were banished from the garden, the place that God had provided for them to provide for them. And we've been on the outside looking in all along until Jesus came in the flesh to reconcile us back to a brand new garden existence. We can get the garden back again, even after blowing it. So that death would only be physical rather than spiritual. Because physical death is no big deal to God. Because the real you can't die anyway unless he destroys your soul. Because that's the real you. Listen, God gives you freedom, but he also puts some limitations on you. You need to hear this. I need to hear this. We all need to receive this. God gives you freedom. God is not a God just standing up and saying, you can't do this and you can't do that. Look at what, how he governed right out of the jump in creation. He gave his brand new man and his brand new woman on his brand new earth absolute and definitive freedom. He defined freedom because he put limits on it. Freedom can't be freedom unless there's limits to the freedom. I want you to think about that. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Any tree. Any tree. That's a whole lot of freedom. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Look, we get into this debate psychologically within ourselves when we kick around the idea of the tithe and the offering. God is demanding, if you will, out of the Old Testament, the tithe, the tenth, the tenth out of everything that comes up in your life that God blesses you with. He only wants 10%. The other 90 is yours. Why is it that we, we kick against the goad of the 10%? Why is it that we're kicking against, I got to give 10%? You got 90 I love it. I, I was <laughs> I was at the church in Dallas. A um, friend of mine, um, Pastor uh, Pastor Freddie Freddie Haynes, and he was teaching about tithing um, out of Malachi, Malachi chapter three, and he actually bought up bags and bags of groceries, bags of groceries, and he had these groceries placed on the uh, the altar of the church, right there at the uh, at the vestibule, and he physically showed what ten percent looked like out of the hole. You get to keep ninety. He visibly showed how much freedom you had to keep the blessings that God gave you. You're only given. He's only asking for ten percent. For those of us who have a problem with ten percent. Once you really see what consists of the 90, you really shouldn't have a problem with what God is asking you for. God gives you freedom, but he also puts some limitations on you. Whenever, listen now, whenever you violate your limitations, you are in rebellion against God. But look at the limitations that God puts on us versus the freedom that God gives us. When it comes down to substance, the substance of wealth and treasure, time, talent, and, 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 and treasure, the three T's even. God is saying, just, just give me 10%. Just recognize my goodness to you by giving back to me and honoring me with 10% of the 100% that I give you. The other 90 is yours. 
of Adam and Eve. He said, all the trees, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but one, but one. They couldn't get the one right. One little command. And they thought that they were being held back from something. Yeah, they were being held back from something, all right? Their destruction. <laughs> they got greedy, thought they were needy when they lacked nothing. Listen, whenever you violate your limitations, you are in rebellion against God. The only limitations of your potential are violations of God's word. God's word tells you what you cannot do. But that becomes our focus wrongly. We should look at the implication of the freedom that he says, what you can do. What you can do. If, if you do anything that doesn't violate the word of God, you are within your freedom. God gives you freedom to do anything and everything except disobey him. That's it. So the way to operate in complete freedom in Christ is to know his word. Because when you know his word, you know what you're free to do. And not only free to do, but capable and enabled to do. We focus in on what we do freely. We sin freely. But there's nothing free about sin. Sin, in and of itself, is evidence of our bondage. Not our freedom. We got this thing backwards. We got the whole plan of life turned inside down and upside down. Jesus came to turn the tables and put everything right side up. You are more free than you ever thought possible. When you're in Christ Jesus and you're obeying what he says, God gives you freedom, complete and absolute freedom to do anything and everything except disobey him. Now, that's a tremendous freedom. That's a whole lot of freedom because you can encapsulate what he says that you cannot do. In book, chapter, and verse, it is written. But what is not written, but given complete freedom, is what you can do. And what you've been enabled and equipped to do. That too is written, and a whole lot of it can't even be summarized. Because your freedom in Christ is so vast. One word that encapsulates our freedom is that when we're in Christ, nothing shall be impossible for you. In other words, I'm taking the limits off. The only limits I'm giving you are the limits that if you violate the limits, it'll lead to your destruction. And I don't want you to be destroyed. I didn't make you to be destroyed. I made you to live life and have life abundantly. Wow, that's tremendous freedom. You're free to do anything within the context of God's word. And the context and confines of God's word, there's a whole lot of limitlessness living in that word. Look, let me summarize it like this. If God says it's cool, go for it. Because the possibilities of your life are all connected with God and to God. We need to start focusing on what God says is cool for us to do. What is cool for us to be. Rather than I can't do this and I can't do that. Thank God that my life comes with some limitations that limit me destroying myself. <laughs> The self that God made, not only to exist in this world, but to thrive and triumph over it. As it tries to put limits on me by deceiving me, telling me to be my own free agent. 
Do whatsoever you want. Go whatsoever you want to go. Be who, so, who, who, whosoever you want to be. Do you. And the word of God is saying, no, do Christ. Be Christ on this earth. Be his, his, his boots on the ground, his hands upon the earth. If you do Christ, you will find you in your doing what Christ does. Does. The secret hidden part of who you are is hidden in Christ Jesus. That's not what makes you a Christian. That's what makes you a disciple. Mm. If God says it's cool, go for it. Because the possibilities of your life are all connected with God. I I want to I want to veer off for a minute. Remember the, the the woman that was caught in adultery, and the Pharisees brought her before Jesus. Really, it wasn't about the woman; it wasn't even about her sin. It was about the fact that they wanted to trip up Jesus. Instead, Jesus tripped them up. According to the law, they said, "We caught this woman in the midst of adultery, in the very midst." Of committing adultery. So according to the law, we must stone her. And Jesus said, wait a minute, hold the phone. Before you proceed to toss a rock in her direction, listen to what I've got to say. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Slowly but surely, those rocks fell out of their hands into the ground. And one by one they began to walk away. You see, religion and religious folk get stuck and hung up on rules and regulations. Jesus came to apply rules and regulations to relationship, not to religion. He said, because I love this woman, I'm giving her another chance. Just as I've given you Pharisees another chance, another opportunity. God says it, it is against his law to have sex with someone you're not married to. But he says, if you blow it. I've got you covered if you stay under my covering. He told the woman to go and sin no more. I've covered you, but I need you to stay under my covering. Now that you know, operate according to the limits that I give you only so that you will not be destroyed. If God says it's cool, go for it because the possibilities of your life are all connected with God. You see, God comes into your life with pruning shears to free you from your disobedience and rebellion. This, this, this young woman um, was confronted by religious leaders. How did they know she was in the midst of what she was in the midst of? <laughs> God only knows. But they only brought one of the two parties in to be judged. I need you to understand that God, God comes into your life with pruning shears to free you from your disobedience and rebellion. Just as this young woman, it looked like she was being hoisted away and taken to Jesus by these Pharisees to be condemned to death. When in fact, Jesus, God in the flesh, 
used his pruning shears, if you will, the word of his own mouth, to free her and to loose her, not from the grasp of these religious leaders, but from the grasp of her disobedience and rebellion. Perhaps she did not know how grave her disobedience and rebellion was. But Jesus, through loving her, freed her. You see, God, he, he comes to take out those things that are stopping you from developing and growing and obeying. When you invite Christ in, he comes to clean you up. Anything that is contrary to the word of God is subject to God's pruning. You know he loves you when he disrupts your disobedience and rebellion. When he steps in and says, I've got greater things for you than this level of living that you're living today. Because you ain't living. You're dying. But because I, you invited me in some time ago, you may have put me on a shelf. You may have traded my relationship with you for the tenets and confines of religion. But I'm coming to tell you how much I love you by pruning you. And pruning hurts sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't merely hurt. It heights. It, <laughs> that, those pruning shears can be sharp sometimes. I'm speaking by experience. But there was no greater love shown than when God steps in and he prunes you with his shears to move you out of any kind of insolescence, disobedience, and rebellion to him because he's got a path to put you on toward life. And he will give you the life he promised you by any means necessary. That's how he demonstrates his love. That's how we experience his love. The word for discipline in the Greek is the same word that's translated as mercy. How about that? And also, it's also a word that can be translated love. How do you get discipline and love in the same, out of the same word? <laughs> because Christ does it. His demonstration of his love for you is when he comes in with his pruning shears to discipline you. And that discipline rids you of disobedience and rebellion, making abundant and abounding life possible all the way into and through eternal life itself. Anything that is contrary to the word of God is subject to God's pruning. If you're really his, he's coming. He's coming for you. Not to wreck you or to ruin you, but to wreck Satan's plan to destroy you. He comes into your life to help you clean up your act. He wants you to enjoy the freedom of obedience and life within his limitations. And his limitations are not the world's limitations. His limitations are, have not been engineered from the kingdom of darkness, but from out of the kingdom of light, because he is light himself and life. Bearing a pruning shear, God comes and trims the useless and dead wood from your life so he can draw from him the, the fresh fullness of your potential. God comes bearing pruning shears. And he's out to trim everything off of you that's loose, that's useless and dead wood. So that you don't wind up on the scrap heap of life to be burned. But rather he's preparing you for the fresh fullness of your potential. Uh, I remember every spring, my, 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 my grandmother, my paternal grandmother would come to the house to dig up the front yard and plant brand new annuals, flowers. And we had roses, rose bush outside of our, our house there in Hillside, New Jersey. And she would come, and uh, I remember as a, as a little boy, she had her pruning shears, and she was cutting off what seemed like really good roses, 
Like, Grandma, what are you doing? You're, you're destroying the tree. You're destroying the rose bush. Why are you cutting off all the roses? She said, son, I'm not destroying the bush. I'm preparing it to grow more roses than it ever had before. I was like, but, but Grandma, you, you're cutting some roses off. She said, you can't appreciate the growth that's coming if you don't prune what's already there. I never quite understood that until some weeks later, later on that spring, when that rose bush budded and blossomed like I hadn't seen it bud and blossom before. And every year, she commenced to that exercise about the same time, each and every year in March. Because God knows what's good for you, he knows what to trim back and trim away to prepare you for the fresh fullness of your potential yet to come. Potential is reality yet demonstrated, yet manifested. It is potential. It can come forth if the environment is right. God comes with pruning shears to shape the environment for your potential to thrive. You're cleansed through the word Jesus speaks to you when, he, when you ask him to forgive you. Wow. Being in relationship with him demands our forgiveness when we miss the mark. And he's prepared to forgive you. He's prepared to forgive me. Thank God for his grace. You see, the lid on your well, you didn't know that there was a lid on your well. You didn't know that you were a, a, a wellspring of life that God put inside of you, but you've been capped. There's a lid on your well put there through your disobedience and Satan's deception. But guess what? It's been pried off by the work of Christ's cross. You've been redeemed to allow your well to pour forth. And not only to pour out, but to be poured back into. Disobedience and the deception of Satan puts a lid on the limitless living you were created to live and have. But that lid has been pried off. The greatest stone in your life has been taken off so that you can come up out of your tomb and live again like the first time. Like it's the first time. Because guess what? Here's the exciting thing. The best is yet to come in your life. Because none of us have lived yet in the fullness of abiding in Christ and his word yet. But when we do, limitless living not only is possible, it's yours. It's yours to have and to enjoy. You see, you're clean and free to do anything that doesn't violate God's word. Free to be all you were created to be and do. Whatever he says you can do. And he says it in your word. In, in his word, he says that greater things than these you shall do. Jesus speaking of himself. You, you'll do what, I've, what I do, and greater things than these you will do. He said it. It came right out of his own mouth. So if he said you can do it, guess what? You can do it. The potential for you to do what Christ did and greater things has already been built into you. What freedom Freedom that can last so long as you remain hooked up to God. The Son, understand this now, the Son is life, and the Father is the maximizer of that life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the Father is the maximizer of it all. Operate within the limitations God has set for you so that you can live in the freedom that God has ordained for you. The abundant life that Jesus Christ, the Son, came to give you is yours to be maximized by God the Father. 
with whom you've been reconciled and reconnected by the redemptive work done by the Son on his cross. He went to his cross. He bore his cross. He triumphed over his cross so that you can bear and triumph over yours. Listen. He and she whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I want you to recognize and learn to appreciate the freedom you have in Christ. The freedom to be everything he's created you to be. To do everything he's created you to be. There's a whole lot of freedom in there. The only limitations that you're limited to in Christ is simply to obey him. Obey his word. And that's what he calls loving him. Loving him means abiding and obeying him. Abiding in him and obeying him. Obeying his word. Amen? That's some freedom for you right there. Well, I want you to use your freedom <laughs> every Thursday night uh, to join us for our latest edition of Mantle Matters, our um, Faith and Finances webinar series. Uh, we are experiencing entrepreneurship from a kingdom perspective. I want you to come out and join us because of this word. This word is carrying over and pouring over into our Tuesday night mantle matters. And mantle matters is pouring out and, and pouring into and oftentimes influencing our Bible study as well. It's time for us to experience God like never before by obeying him. And what does Jesus say? What does this clarion call to? Obedience for his disciples engage in business until I come. Well, all that we're asked to do is to flourish in the freedom that he's given you. And he's, he's pointing the way to your freedom. Freedom from lack. Freedom from frustration. He's saying, do what I say so that you can have what I've come to give you. Engage in business until I come. That's what we're doing on Tuesday night. Join us at 9 Eastern Time. 8 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Don't miss this Thursday. And then every Wednesday morning, join us for Perspective Matters Prayer Call, where we join together to offensively intercede for our generation. Meet us on this same line at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, 5 a.m. Central Time, 4 a.m. Mountain Time, and 3 a.m. Pacific Time. And then... Don't miss a single Thursday. Um, join us on this same call, this same time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursday, every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. Mountain Time, and 6 p.m. Pacific Time. Our next week for Perspective Matters Online Bible Study, continuing on in our series, Living with Purpose, Turning Potential into Action, our topic next week. It's a long one. Are you ready? Your source, your creator, determines the conditions you need for optimum performance. How many of us want to maximize and optimize our performance as people on the earth? And not just any old people, but God's people. His disciples, his ambassadors. Just think of what it means to be an optimum performing ambassador for the kingdom. Wow. That's exactly what the Lord is leading us into. Join us next Thursday night. Amen. Let's go before the Lord and pray out, and I will stay on board after we end the recording. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, Koinonia, we want to chop it up and have a little fellowship together from across the nation. Many of you have, are on this particular call. Um, be happy to uh, stay on board and mingle with you, all right? Let's go before the Lord. Father God, we thank you and we praise you. Lord God, for yet another time of Bible study, another time of you speaking into our lives that we might flourish on this earth and bring your kingdom to bear upon it through our flourishing because it's not we who flourish but you who flourishes in us and causes us to flourish causes us to profit causes us to be 
fruitful, to multiply, to fill, and to have dominion. God, we thank you and we praise you that we are yours. And you are indeed ours. Lord God, we know that we are yours because you love us even as you discipline us. It is because you love us that you do discipline us. You love us into flourishing in our freedom, O oh God. We thank you and we praise you. Lord God, I pray that you would give us all the unction, our spirit, communing with your Holy Spirit in the temple and tabernacle of our own hearts. Oh, God, that we might get this seminal message spoken to us throughout of your word and by way of your Holy Spirit tonight. That we might enjoy our freedom to obey you. That we would love you through our obedience. Lord God, I pray that we would get this message. That we would recognize, appreciate, and appropriate the freedom that you came to give us, coming in the flesh and sacrificing all of the glory of heaven to live some 33 years on this earth, coddled as a child by earthly, an earthly mother, taught by an earthly father, but taught even more substantively and substantially by your heavenly father, that we might learn to do what you did and say what you said, that we might share your kingdom with you as your underlords, as your disciples and ambassadors of your kingdom. Oh God, for us to flourish in our ambassadorship, in our kingdom citizenship, Oh, God, I pray that we would understand the freedom that exists in those small limitations that you give us, that we might live limitless upon this earth and demonstrate your power and your love. God, we thank you for this word. Now let us do what you say, that we might have what you've promised us. These things we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Wow, I don't think anybody's mad but the devil. God bless y'all. Hold on. Stay on the line. We'll chop it up a little while. Uh, join us on next Tuesday for our next edition of Mantle Matters. Otherwise, I'll see you online over the weekend. God bless you.